Ooh, hello, we're back at Zim Explorer, and I am Dr. Abstract. This is the third part in an exploration of a kid's app where we were dropping counters and shaking them in, in a cup to do some early math. Let's go take a look at where we were then. Hmm, perhaps a more visual look. Oh, <laughs> the animations come back. A very slow motion, bouncing animation. Maybe one day we should turn that uh, that animation back to uh, normal speed. All right, so we'll refresh here. And if you haven't seen, if you've just arrived and haven't seen the other two, the earlier two explorers, there were two parts. We ran into some holiday visitors, so had to cut the last explorer short. <laughs> the old short 30 minute <laughs> explorer. I'm not sure, maybe it wasn't 30. Anyway, we're dropping coins in there and we're just seeing how this, how these fall. And let's go in and take a look at the code for that. So here we are, each time we make a clone of our one that we have up top here. So uh, this counter is what we're cloning. When we clone, we get things like the X and Y that were set here, we get that. I can't remember if we get the cursor as well. I don't. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't think so. But we won't get the animation. So when we clone something, it doesn't clone the animation that's happening on it. And a few other things. There's also copy, I believe. No, duplicate. Duplicate is like a clone, but it goes through and actually copies all of the custom properties as well. Still wouldn't get the method, the animate method, but any custom properties that you would add to the circle, it would uh, clone those. Anyway, we're, we're cloning that, so it does get an X and Y, but we would still, uh, we're running an animate and a rotation on that. Oh, it would get the rotation as well, but we're randomizing the rotation and animating. We talked about the animation of, of the counter in the last Zim Explorer, so have a look back there. And we're bouncing and we've got the call. So this is what we're doing at the end. We stop the animation because this one up here, this one right here is going forever because it's going to loop and rewind well, almost forever or whatever. So when we stop animate on, on the copy, it will stop this from, from rotating. So that's what that's doing. We're then setting the scale back to one so that we can see that uh, facing us. Yeah, we kind of thought about, we, we, we tried it when we were building this, we tried tried it what it would look like if these didn't stop and face us, if we just left them at, at various angles. It looked okay, but I think it, as, as we go into the animation here, it probably, <laughs> the slow motion animation, it probably made, made you know, more sense just to show them facing us there. It's, it's a, a game for kids, they don't need it to be totally realistic. So we bring that back to show what's in there. And we're animating, we talked about this in the last Explore as well, where we're setting the color to either pink or blue there. So what happens next? Aren't we missing something? Oh, they, that, that's the them falling. So the thing that happens next, uh, we've already talked about the bounce sound. Here's the the checkboxes and uh, radio, uh, no, checkboxes and toggle, checkbox and toggle for the sound. So we haven't looked at this, but what comes next in the scheme of things is pressing on the cup. So when we press on the cup, which is up here, cup, here's the cup, and it is indeed the cup pick that we're on mouse down, we call shake. So shake is the next main function that we take a look at. But before we get to shake, why don't we take a look at these sound bits, which is right here. So this is a checkbox that we're starting checked. And we're starting it based on our remembered music. So the checkbox is, do we want the music to be playing? We're positioning, or we're scaling that a little bit smaller. We're positioning it at the bottom left setting its alpha to zero, and then we're animating up to an alpha of 0.8 in that amount of time. When that checkbox changes, we're remembering the toggled state. So here's whether it's toggled or not. This will be true or false. We need to turn that into a string, into a JSON string. 
and store that in our local storage so that we remember that setting as a string. <coughs> Excuse me. Just had a sweet cookie. <coughs> it's in my throat. <coughs> um, if the sound is toggled, then we want to turn back on the animation, or back on the, uh, the backing sound. So animate the backing sound to a volume of, oh, actually this is for either of them. Wait a minute. If sound toggled. <clears throat> well, that's just saying, do we want sound playing? So if we want sound playing, the, we're toggling either it to one or zero. Wouldn't we want to toggle it to one or zero all the time? No, we wouldn't. That's right. Okay, that makes sense. But why toggle it off? Yeah, that also makes sense. Yeah, we've just toggled it off. So we want to toggle it off regardless of the sound. Is playing. Oh, actually, this could be a bug. Um, I think the sound was working properly. But when we toggle it off, we want the volume to be zero. Oh, that maybe doesn't matter because the sound is, uh, if it's not on, it will already be at zero. Okay, let's leave it at that. And here's the toggle. And the toggle is very similar. As a matter of fact, we started with a toggle. We probably wanted to keep it as a toggle. It would have been nice if when this started off, we just had uh, hide, hide the thing on the left here, the music. We just had the sound right here in the middle. That That's nice. And when we bring in the other animation to be able to sort, it sits right next to it, kind of right here in the middle of everything. But the sound is uh, these guys, like that. The music is this. And if you're a teacher, you may not want the music going. You might want the sound effects on, because they're fun. Oh, or slow motion sound. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> we should do this, the, the, the sound in slow motion too. Anyway, here comes the sort button in here. So uh, I'm trying to talk to you now. You're trying to listen. We don't want this background music on. So there, we need, we need both really. Uh, and yet we, we do want the sound effects. If, if we uh, make, make changes, we want the sound effects and it's fun to have the dropping sound effects. So there you go. We need both. <clears throat> so we made the toggle there. They work very similar in a similar manner. And we position that. We animate it in. We waited a little bit longer. Here's a weight of 1.5 and a weight of 2. So that those... Oh, you know what? Did we get that the wrong way around? Let's have a look. Might be the wrong way around. We animated... Oh, are they... Uh, which way? Oh yeah, this animates up, so that's fine. I was, if you're animating both in from the left, so say we animated both of these things in, we would want to animate this one in first and this one in second. But I think what we're doing is animating this one in from the side and this one in from the bottom. <laughs> Go away, taskbar. <laughs> Let's have a look. It looks like that just fades in, so maybe they're just both fading in, so fine. Fade that in, fade that in. They're not even coming in from a location. Alphas. Alphas. Yeah. And the same deal with the turning or remembering of the sounds. Here's the shake. We're going to allow shaking if the children, uh, oh, if the children is less than three, so they're less than three coins, then return. Don't, don't bother shaking. So that's how we've handled that. And then if there's a drop timer. So if the drop timer exists, if if we're currently counting up to one second while the latest coin is falling, then return. And that's how we stop it from shaking while uh, one of the counters is falling. Coin counter, whatever. And if we can play the sound, then we're going to play the sound. We also play the bounce out sound a couple times. This is like all of them bouncing. Let's put the animation back to normal speed. Hmm. What was it? Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. 
we were and where the shake was, which is down in here. 0.5 wiggles, spill, it's in the spill. Okay, so instead of 10 seconds, one second. So 10 seconds, one second. Was that the last one? No, there it is. One second. Okay, so let me refresh here. So we're now at the shake. Here's the shake. Hey, back to normal. Good. Okay, so that's the spill, but we're in the shake. Did we do the shake yet? No, I don't think so. That's where we were. All right, so we've got some bounce sounds. Why are the bounce sounds here, though? Time out one. 1.5 bounce sounds shake. Oh right, so we press. Is shake and spill are kind of all connected. You basically press it, it shakes it for a little while, and then it automatically spills it down here. So after 0.75 seconds, we're spilling. So how do how do we do the shaking? We're gonna wait for that like that amount of time until the bounce. What we might have done is taken those bounce sounds and stuck them in the spill. Would have maybe made more sense. So we're animating in some instructions or out. We're animating out some instructions. These are the first instructions. We animate them out. We don't allow them to click on the cup again. So no pressing on the cup again. And we remove the counter because we're, we're not going to be adding any more coins. We wiggle the cup in its X and its rotation. Here's what the wiggling in just the X would look like. <clears throat> How's it going out there? Ah, this is a long explorer, huh? But there's a lot going on in this app. So let's add some things. And here's what wiggling in the X looks like. Not bad. But we thought we would just add a little bit of the wiggling in the rotation. And here's what wiggling the rotation looks like. Wiggles can be slow wiggles or fast wiggles. So what the wiggle, what we're saying here is wiggle the X property. When we're specifying a property, we do so as a string. Can't just say X because that, that would be a variable. So we specify the property as a string. We say it's starting position. So this is wherever the X currently is. That's where we want to wiggle around. And then we're going to rotate 20 either to the left or right or 20 to 40. So somewhere in there, this is the range, at least 20 to 40 in at least 0 0.05 seconds to 0 0.1 seconds. So the speed or the time is a random thing and the value is a random thing. And then this is for a total time. Usually we don't do a total time. In this case, we're only wiggling for a certain amount of time. So we can put a total time on there if you want, but it's very rare that we wiggle. Usually, we're always like once we wiggle something, we're always wiggling, uh, unless that something goes away or what have you. But anyway, that's how you can do a time, and we're doing that for both of them. And then we are uh, going to spill it. So we'll we'll wiggle that for a little bit, and then we'll spill it. The rotation we're rotating about zero. We're giving it at least two to five degrees, either way. And there is a setting, by the way, another parameter in here to go only one way or the other. Uh, but it's nice to have a wiggle like this. Animate doesn't really wiggle. Animate, we can animate two random amounts, but animate will go from an amount to another amount. It will not wiggle about an amount. It will not start in the middle and wiggle sometimes this way and sometimes the other way. So it doesn't go back and forth around a point. It only goes from one point to another point. And that's a different thing. It's, it's similar, but it's not quite the same. So we introduced wiggle. And uh, we're also, we're deciding at this point, we're, we're now shaking the, the the counters are in the cup. We now know how many counters we have. So what this is doing is it's recording how many blues there are. So it, we're looping through the counters. Counters is a container. We're using the loop method. 
When we use the loop method on a container, we're given the child. We can also collect the I and the total in here as well if we want, like that. But we really, in this case, only need the counter. So loop through the counters container each time we're given one of the counters. If the counters color is blue, then we're going to increase the number that's stored in the answers for blue. Uh, answers is basically just an array of three numbers. One is how many blues there are, one is how many pinks there are, so that's the second one, and the last one is how many do we have. So this is getting our data, our, our, like our right answer basically. How many blues, how many pinks, how many total? Okay, we could have calculated the total obviously, but it was, you know it's not that hard to just put the total in there and it makes, makes it easier down the road. All right, and then we go to spill. Let's take a look at spill. Uh, in building this, we could have taken all of this spill stuff and stuck it right here. Oh, but it still has to be in a timeout. We could have uh, put it into an arrow function. That's probably how we did have it. Okay, I'll take all of this stuff, stick it right in there. And some people do that. Arrow functions are, you know, easy to use and we use them a lot. But it just makes this function of shaking, it would be more than shaking, it's shake and spill. You'd have to call it shake and spill. It makes that function a bit longer and this is a little, a little nested in here. And so uh, why not just take it easy? Just say, hey, timeout after 0.75 call spill. We don't call it, remember not to call it right there. We don't say spill round brackets because that would run it right away, take the results of this and call the results after 0.75, which is not what we want. This is the function that we will call after 0.75 function, after 0.75 seconds, just like events. Okay, and just like the loop, this is the function that we will loop each time. This is it. We're not calling that function, we're saying what the function is. Here, we're not calling the function, we're saying what it is, same thing. This says what the function is, it doesn't call it. It's the loop that is calling this arrow function and passing into it a counter or uh, its child, I guess. All right, coming down, <laughs> isn't that funny? Yeah, it's child, child happens to be a counter. Not, not an I, the I is an iterator or a counter. <laughs> Come after that, funny. Uh, oh, the amusement, oh, 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 oh. All right, spill, what do we do while we're spilling? We locate the cup, oh, the cup has been shaking. So we're gonna locate the cup at its original starting point that we talked about in our first explore of this whole thing. We said, hey, we're gonna be shaking the cup, so we wanna make sure that we always put it back to where it started. If we don't do that, we end up with a result that is in a different place each time, just slightly. You see how this has been spilled? If we didn't put it back to its starting point or the same point each time, these things would constant. Sometimes they'd be here, sometimes they'd be here, sometimes they'd be here. <laughs> you know, that was happening. We're going, something funny is going on. I keep on trying to align. I was trying to align these three things to 10 of, 10 of them. When we run 10, let's run 10. There we go. So you see how these 10 things align with those? <laughs> I would I would set these and then we shake them and then these things would be like right here and I'd be going, oh, I didn't get the alignment right. And I align this over a little bit and I shake it again. It would be off again. Eventually, I said, what the heck is going on? And realized because we were wiggling, it, it was starting its animation at a slightly different place each time because whatever, whenever the wiggle stopped, it was like randomly at a, a location. So we reset those and now they always stop kind of right in the right place. Yay, Woo, what glory. And then we're animating, we're animating the X back a little bit and we're also rotating 90. We talked a little bit about this in the, in the previous ones where when we rotate this cup, we rotate the whole container 90 and then we rotate the cup back 10 degrees. 
and that was because uh, the cup, if it if it were not rotated back 10 degrees, it would be slanted down like this and come up and then come on over. And, and it would be nicely centered on these, but the bottom edge would be tilted down and that didn't look, I wanted it so the bottom edge tilted kind of along the floor like that. So as we tilt the whole thing down, we tilt the actual cup image up a little bit, 10 degrees. We didn't just tilt the whole container 80 because then all of these things would be aligned facing here. They'd be slanted facing up at 90, or sorry, at 80. So all of it would be at 80, including these guys. We want these guys to be at 90, and we want the cup to be back up 10. So that was what led us to this arrangement here. And then we are animating out the counters. So we're looping through the counters, counters.loop. Each time we collect a counter, and this time we do need the index number because we're going to use the index number to say how far to go. So that's the animating of all of these things, which used to be right on the, on, in the cup, at the bottom of the cup. We're animating, animating them out to a location, to a Y location and an X location. It's a little bit weird. This cup, inside this cup, Y is going positive up. No, negative up. Y is going negative up. And uh, X is negative up. <laughs> okay, Y is going negative to the right here. <laughs> Just imagine picking up the whole cup and these things and, and turning them up here. Basically, it's uh, negative up and negative x is to the left. So this is negative x, and this is negative y. No big deal. Anyway, we're animating, based on i, we're animating um, the first set to here, and the next set to here, and the next set to here. But note that we want the pairs to be at the same y position. So this pair is at one y, this is pair is at another y, etc. That's going negative. Maybe we're starting negative and animating positive. Yeah, I think that's right. So we start at a, a certain a negative amount, and then we increase each time. So it's the first batch is going to here, then here, then here, then here, then here. And uh, the x is going, it's alternating. The x is going here, 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 here. So we have to deal with that with the index, or the iterator number i. So here's our iterator, sometimes referred to as an index, I guess, i. And this is what we're doing. We're animating the y to a negative 460. So that was up far, like negative 460, way over here. Then what we're doing is we're dividing i by 2. So that will be 0, 1 half, 1, 1 and 1 half, 2, 2 and 1 half. And we're flooring it. So that will be 0, 0, because 1 half floored is 0. 1 floored is 1, 1 1.5, or 1 and 1 half is, is 1. So this will be 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, times the counter's width, plus a spacing, all in brackets. And that basically spaces it out, the first two here, the next two here, by a counter, plus a spacing. And then the, the bottom one here, we're using the modulus, which is the remainder, so that's like i divided by 2, and what's the remainder? 0 divided by 2 is considered 0 remainder. 1 divided by 2 is considered 1 remainder. 2 divided by 2 is 0, com uh, zero remainder. Uh, 3 divided by 2 is 1 remainder. 4 divided by 2 is 0 remainder, etc. So you get 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. We're taking the 0, if it's 0, 1, 0, 1, or if it's 0, uh, right, if it's double equal to 0, then use 100 plus the counters width plus the spacing. So that means move it over uh, 100 plus, 100 is the base. Uh, it would kind of be like that if, if we didn't have the base. So move it over width plus the spacing or leave it where it is. So that's what's spacing it. But we're saying actually push it down uh, 100 and for both of them. Not a thousand and 100 plus that. Okay, that just uh, takes it, it, it used to be, it, it would have been about this high right here, but we've moved it, each of them down 100, and then this one even more. That's, that gives us, so a little bit of 
a little bit of light math. That's almost as mathy as I, you know, usually would would could get. Um, sometimes if you work with circular things, you you've got sines and cosines and that kind of stuff. Even even those you can bypass the sines and cosines sometimes by using registration point and rotating. Uh, but that's about as mathy as I usually get. It's that kind of stuff. Another way to do it would be. Uh, I hardly ever have to do that stuff anymore because we've got a tile that that looks like a tile tiles really easy to do say hey five columns and two rows or something problem is it started not in a tile but we could have done something like tiled something and then animated each of these to whatever index in the tile and then use the tile to find out the positions and just you know have it be it visible you know almost like a placeholder but whatever it was almost nice to do this again I haven't done it in a while <laughs> Uh, used to do this a lot when we tile thumbnails or what have you, but with Zim Tile, hardly ever do it. And I use Tile all the time, like tons of time using Tile. Almost every app uses Tile a couple times. Anyway, uh, in this amount of time, a time of one is default, so that means we don't even need it. And we're waiting for each one. This is like doing a sequencing i times 0 0.05. Basically, this is saying wait. A little bit and that little bit keeps on growing as I grows so and it ends up them sort of spilling out in in a sequence we have zim sequence which allows you to animate in a sequence but we're not using we're animating each counter at the moment we're not animating the whole tile of counters oh the whole container of counters I should say because we want different values in here so we instead of animating all of the counters in a sequence we're looping through the counters and animating each one individually and then applying the weight but basically it's accomplishing the same thing as a sequence in zim animate after two seconds we call the details and we're getting there all right we're nearly there let's um, pop on down and check what we do in these details so the details portion is this stuff right here and here the sorting so for the details the idea is we're trying to match or have the kids match the number of blue ones one two three four five six blue ones one two three four five six this is a number stepper so it can be used by clicking the arrows it can also be dragged with a mouse up and down like that so on mobile that makes it nice and easy to move as well or dragging left and dragging right as well. You drag faster or slower depending on how far away you are. So uh, that's neat, huh? And if you click on it too, that just by default increases. So how many do we want? Six and four, etc. So anyway, that's it. Now we've got a unique color for each of these. Blue to represent the blue, pink for the pink, and then total is just the gray. Initially, we started with the background of, of, of blue, but then the arrows look a bit odd as white, but we could make the arrows blue as well. That's that's default. If you set the background color of a stepper, the arrows go the same color. But then it looked a bit too dark. I mean, this had to be white, white, and this one. Anyway, in the end, just decided on adjusting the border and the color, and I think that's a bit more consistent uh, feeling. And we made sure that we added text underneath. There's no easy way aside from running a tile we could have possibly tiled this and put a spacer in here but <coughs> anyway what we've done is we've tiled these three things and just run some uh, a label with some spaces in here until they they lined up blue pink and total <laughs> close enough huh all right let's have a look at that stuff then so here's the instructions the instructions also got animated in there up top change the numbers to match. Test is a new container and what's that going to hold? I think that's going to hold all of the steppers and the title. So this is the container. When we use when we locate that container, you see that was the thing we we weren't sure where we were going to put these things and sometimes if if you don't know where you're going to put them, sometimes it's easier to use a container to, to place them. So in they come. So now I'm picking that whole thing up 
and I, I wanted to sort of see where, where I'd be putting that. And when we do, if we have 12, we take a look. Intro is not defined. Um, right there, there's the numbers that we're getting right there in the console. 41 intros not defined. And so we use place, and then we comment that out, and paste those numbers in there, whatever the numbers are. Then. For page for or not page line forty one. Imagine if these were pages. Intro dot on close. Oh, we we're talking about that uh, const intro equals. How does the app even run? Oh, okay. It was, I was playing around with this stuff earlier to show that we could do it in one step if we really wanted to. That's better. Const intro. Okay. okay. So where were we? We're down here in the container. I was talking about place, but anyway, that's now. If we wanted to animate that in, which I think we did, which is probably why we stuck it all in a container, rather than animate in each of these things. Watch as this animates in now. Ooh, all blue. Look, all that stuff animates in together. So rather than try and put an animation on each one, put it in a container and animate the container in, which is what we've done there. So test is that container. There's the animation. We've got if the sound is uh, if the sound is on, then play the ta-da. That's the pa-boom, and then wait 0.8 seconds and call it again pa-boom. That was the one animating in, and then the other one animating in from the bottom. Pa-boom, pa-boom. It's kind of a heavy-handed animation sound, but it was you know what I had at the moment. All right, we've got a lot of steppers, so we're going to style them. Or we've got three steppers, so there it is. We're tiling a new stepper. Hey. Rather than put all, well, actually, maybe it wouldn't matter because since we're putting, we've only got one stepper there and we could have put all that stuff inside there. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I'm not sure if our series would be, would kick in. They probably would. Yeah, so maybe we didn't even have to, to put this out on style. But if we had made three separate steppers, um, then uh, the styling would have been faster. We had some problems with this. The stepper wasn't taking a background color of these three things because there were too many things in the stepper that had background colors. The arrows had background colors and the, uh, the text box had a background color. So in the end, it was just, it, it, was, it was messing up through the series, but the color was only being used once in the stepper and the border color was only being used once so we ended up doing it this way we'll have to look into that as a potential glitch basically each time we make a stepper it's going to pick from this series the first one will be blue next one pink and next one tin color is the text color border color same deal the border width is the same delay pick true is something you probably would not have thought of when it's in a tile, the tile is going to clone this stepper. So by default, a tile will clone something. It makes the stepper, then it clones it. Well, if it makes the stepper, um, it already pre-picks this in a sense. It ends up cloning the blue one. So what we did is we said, okay, uh, I think anyway, let's just have it check here. It's a complex situation. Yeah, they're all blue. So it just cloned the blue one. So what we're doing is saying in the styling, delay the pick, don't, don't pick it immediately, delay it all the way through to the clone. And that's what that stands for and also no drop shadow. I don't know why we didn't want to drop shadow. We could just... We didn't. <laughs> it 
Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And now the clones will all get uh, the styles picked. Something like that, anyway. Here's the steppers tiling, three of them, a one and 50 spacing between them. We're scaling those to smaller and we're adding them to the test so that when the test animates in, right here, uh, right here, all of this stuff goes, all these steppers go with it. We're looping through the steppers to apply their events. We could have, actually, I think, a change event can be put on the tile, and if the elements of the tile have change events, then they'll go to it. I wonder what is going on with the answers. We're just testing it. We probably could have chained that right on to the end there. Let's try it. Oh, no loop here. Okay, so we're testing for answers. That's right, I forgot. If, ooh, ooh, that was the, that's the label. You want to chain that right on to here. So tile.onChange. If the tile has only stepper or things with change events in them, inside them, or even not if it's only, but they'll still capture the change event on the tile. Okay, let's see if it works. So we refresh that, and but otherwise we were looping through each of those steppers and applying the change event. Two blues. So we can't tell if it's if it's working or not. It's a, a change event is happening. Basically, what that change is doing is trying to find out if we've done this right. One pink. If this if we go to three here, dum dum dum, and it says win. Oh, so I was wrong. Are we getting any errors? Twelve. Yeah, certainly we are. Steppers dot loop is not a function. Okay, what's going on there? Oh. We change, okay, so this is a good example. You're wondering why does the steppers right here, this container, why does it no longer have a loop method? Steppers definitely has a loop method because it's it's a container of steppers. Uh, is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a tile. It's a tile as a container of steppers. It, we can loop through the tile. Here it is, steppers. We've applied that tile to steppers. We're scaling, we're adding to, and we're awning. There it is, right there. We chained the on event to the tile. That means the steppers is no longer equal to this tile. It's equal to the results of the on event, which is a, a reference to the function so that we can turn it off. It's a reference to the event function so we can turn it off, off whatever that reference is. So do not chain an on we just ran into this weird thing that was telling us a weird thing that was saying steppers.loop is not a function we go what steppers is a tile why can't we loop through the tile or you know it's a container why can't we loop through it it's because steppers is no longer a container or the tile steppers is just uh, the results of this on so do not chain on chain the dot change which is a chainable method that captures a change event. It's just the same thing as the on, except it doesn't return the ID, it returns the object, steppers, or the tile. So there we are chaining on a dot change. Same with the dot tap. A tap we can chain on a dot tap, that's the same as a click kind of, or similar. We can chain on a dot change, which is similar to an on change, except it's chainable. We refresh here. Now well, let's try this again. Ooh, what exploration! <laughs> I can't believe you're still here. If you're still here, you're amazing. One, two, three, blues. Isn't that funny? I think we got the same same arrangement as the last time. One, and then this is four. Maybe not quite. One, two, three, and all right, we did it. 
So um, we were right after all that we can actually chain a change method onto a tile. If the things inside the tile have change methods, they'll be activated. And then you can use e.target to find out which one inside is activated. In this case, we don't actually care because what we're going to do is we're just going to, as soon as any of the steppers change, we have to find out, do all of the steppers match the answers? So let the answers be. We're going to loop through the steppers and we're going to find out if the steppers current value, such as um, uh, 1, 2, or 3, or 0, is not equal to answers at i. So there's three steppers. We've got three, three elements in the answers array. We've got uh, the number of red, the number of green, and the number of blue. So, or sorry, <laughs> I'm getting tired. I've been talking now for close to two or three hours. You're probably tired too. You've been listening now for as long. Anyway, the number, uh, number of blue, number of pink, and total. Yeah, all right, so is the stepper, does it match the answers? Now check this out. This is just like wonderful. This is the Zim loop. A Zim loop will reply with true, or it will return true if the loop finishes. However, if in the loop we end up returning something, if we return a value, that means the loop does not finish, and the loop gets this value that we return. If we just return, that means the loop skips this time. It goes no further. Well, there is no further, but so uh, this would be no different than whether we didn't. But if we did something in here, then um, uh, I guess we could check it out. We'll just zog red. I haven't typed in a while either. We're zogging red. So, uh, oh, this is, gonna, this is filled with double negatives and negatives and whatever. So, whatever. We're going to see some zogs and maybe, maybe not others. There we go. Okay, so we tilt this, and in come these. Each time we check the stepper, it's going to check, is this one equal to the number of blues? Is this one equal to the number of pinks? And is this one equal to the totals? <laughs> Crap, it said yay, <laughs> of course. So uh, what this is saying is um, continue on in the loop and the loop finishes to the end and therefore the answer is whatever the loop returns, which is correct. So, ah, oh, crap, anyway, that doesn't work at all. Um, what were we returning? We're returning false in here. Anyway, it's like a gauntlet. Uh, if we return false, that gets put into the answers. So in other words, if it's not equal to the answer, this will be false. Look how elegant that is. Keep on looping. If any of them is wrong, we return false, which gets put into this, and therefore we know that we have the wrong answer. So answer is going to return true if all of these uh, are true. Cool, huh? It takes a little getting used to, but it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, I've been coding for a long time, and it's just a wonderful convenience to have something like that with the Zim loop. You know, aside from the looping itself, looping is really convenient as well. This is saving two or three lines and complexities of a for loop and stuff, and it's giving us just whatever we want here. It's so nice. And then we turn the style off because we've uh, gone through and tiled those steppers. We've made all the steppers now. We don't want these styles to be applied anymore to anything else in the future. Bump. The other way to turn styles off is use the style Use the style class directly. It's a uh, static class, and we can say dot clear like that. Oops, uh, the clear method, static method of the style class. That would be the alternative. We kind of thought this was a little baked in. You apply styles with the object literal, and if you ever want to remove those styles or change them, you can adjust them however you would an object literal. If you want to remove them, just set it to nothing or set it to null would be fine. You know, that's fine as well, but it seemed like, eh, you know, maybe we should have a procedure for applying styles. So we introduced the style uh, dynamic class or static class, sorry, static class, which allows you to do a variety of things. You can add styles, you can add groups, you can add 
um, uh, types. Types or type? I can't remember. So you've got a bunch of different things you can do in there, including clear. I usually use that stuff. Here's our instructions that go in the test underneath that. That's great. Sorting. If we want to sort, we're on our last thing here. We're nearly there. Hopefully you guys are doing okay. You don't have to watch this all at once. You can you can put it on pause, go get a cookie. Why don't you go get a cookie right now? Grab some milk. We'll go into the sorting. I'd, I'd love to get a cookie and some milk. <laughs> all right, so this, yeah, this will do. The sorting, we wanted to put all of the, the blues first and then all of the pinks. So ready? blues first then the pinks I think ideally probably we would have animated swapped them like we would have moved you know whatever blues needed to move over to the left and and, and the pinks moved to the right and animated there perhaps with a sequence so one moves the next one kind of moves as uh, you know like point two two seconds or something boop 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 and they all sort of move to the right places that's a little harder to work out. I'm sure we could have done it, but what we basically did is we just looked at the right answers. We took the right answers. We made an array that had uh, five blues in it, or you know whatever, four blues or three blues, and then five or six or whatever pinks. And we made an array of that. So it was blue, 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 pink, 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 pink. Okay, so that's an array that represents the sort order that we wanted. And it's pretty easy to make that array. So here it is. This is the button to do the sorting, and we're animating that in. But when we tap on that button, here's what we were doing. Here's our array that will have all of the sorted colors. We loop through the answers at, um, at one. That's all the pinks, because we're going to put the pinks first, I guess, and then the blues. That's just how it works. Out. So we're, we're finding out how many pinks do we have. This might say five pinks or four pinks. Okay, so this is the number four. A loop will loop a number. By the way, if that's a number, we can't put it here. We can't say that dot loop. The dot loop is only for containers. Containers have a loop method. Otherwise, you're using the loop function in Zim. This is looping through however many numbers is here, four of them. Each time you're going to get what we, uh, so imagine that would be something like four of them and this is something like uh, three of them okay so loop four times each time we're given the index and push pink do we even need the index yeah we don't even need the index do we so it's just like that would be fine so um, push pink into there so four times push pink into there three times push blue into there. Crap. We don't need the eye. And I do, it's almost easier to put the eye in. It is easier to put the eye. Okay, however many times it says in the answers there are for pink, push a pink one in there. However many the answers say for blue, push a blue in there. Um... I'm just thinking, remember how when we animated these from the cup over, we the very first one animates the farthest. So basically, they an, the first one is animating to here, and then they, they, add, they stack up like that. So that's why we're starting with the pinks, because we want the pinks to be the farthest from the blue, so that the blues are here and the pinks are there. But it just happened that the first tiles we put are, are farther, so that's why that is uh, swapped in here. <clears throat> I didn't really know that until I tried it. When I tried it, I went, well, why are we seeing all the blue ones on the right and the pink ones? And then I had to come in here and say, well, how do we fix that? Oh yeah, okay, let's let's put the pink ones in here first. <laughs> Probably could have revert, you know, put this first and that second and then put the reverse of the sorted, dot reverse round brackets. Anyway, here we are looping, or we could have maybe looped in reverse, comma, but I think I did, and in the way that we were animating, anyway, the loop comma true would do the loop in reverse. Now we're looping through this array. Now that we've made this array with our colors in there, we just loop through the counters. 
So this is us looping through all the counters. We're given a counter, we're given an I. Do we need the I yet? So we're given the counter in the container and we're given an I. And we're saying if sorted, so if the value at I, if whatever we've got in that array at I is not equal to the counters color, animate the counters color to whatever color is in the sorted. Isn't that neat? So we put them all in the right order, and then we go through and say, hey, if it's not the right color, then animate it to that color. And that's what we're doing. This could probably have been done all inside of the loop with some testing and, and increasing. Well, we've got a, an I increasing. We'd, I don't know, but I just it was sort of like harder to do. If the I is less than the answers at one, and the color is not this, then do that else if it's greater than and the color is not this one. You know, it would have been something like that. And I just thought, hey, maybe it's nicer to uh, make an array with the, the right answers in it. And then just loop through, see if the color matches the right answer. We've made a sound to do that sorting. So we've got a sorting sound and we're playing it as long as we have sounds. And then we're animating the button away. We're waiting for a second and animating the button off the stage. So the Y position is the stage height plus 100. I guess it's not relative. I suppose we could have done it relative and just said, uh, move it up 100, okay, or 150 maybe. But here we know that we want it off the stage. So let's uh, move it to 100 plus the stage height back in. This time we're, we're starting like it's going back and then heading off the stage in a time of 0.7. Let's have a look at that. All right, so here it is. That animated back out. But now when we sort this, there it goes sorted, it kind of goes off and then it swoops down. And note that these are all sorted. <coughs> Great. Yeah, wow, amazing, huh? Super duper. And now we just uh, have to make sure that they're right. Uh, what do we got? Seven, eight, one, one, two, three, that's six, seven. We got seven, we've got one, two, three, and we've got 10. Yay! When we get it right, we play a particle emitter, we make the emitter go, and then we pull up an again. The again's going to just reload the page, but if we click off, we're, we're left here. Let's take a look at that particle emitter again. So I'm, I've got the wrong answer, and I'm going to the right answer. The emitter explodes, and then up comes the screen, and a sound plays. All right, let's have a look. So we're nearly there. Here's what happens if we're correct. So how do we know if we're correct again? It was back up somewhere in that loop that we had correct. So if the answer is correct, we call correct. So if the answer is correct, call correct. Here's the correct stuff. We make the emitter. Uh, an emitter can be this easy. New emitter and we'll start paused. Let's have a look. If we don't start paused, we so remember when we're, uh, if we don't start paused, it, it would start running right away. We could make the new emitter inside of the correct function. We could make the emitter there, but then each time we got it correct, it would make a new emitter. And that's not necessarily optimal. So we want to make the emitter first outside. We almost always want to make just one emitter. So here it is. Here's, here's the emitter sitting outside and we're going to start it paused by default, true. So that is how easy an emitter is. Let's see what it looks like. And many times, actually do, many times I get away with it, just a default emitter. It's basically just a bunch of Zim colors. That looks like two, uh, three blues. One, two, three, and two, making five. Ready? <laughs> Let's try that again. See that? So it's close. Uh, just a little small. So I might want them bigger. Often emitters 
aren't the whole screen it is like a little something this number went up you got a little emitter and it, it's you know it's not that that big but i wanted a kind of like a big explosion everywhere i didn't quite know where to put this emitter like, when we get it right where do we put it so i just stuck it right in the center and made it big and it's sort of like an emitter that is bringing in the pain as opposed to an emitter on a little guy when he gets hit or on a little fireplace over here <laughs> or a little stars that are sprinkling down from something right it's just an overall explosion that's going to bring in the pain the pain's about this big so we need kind of like a bigger emitter possibly there's scale but even so so what do we do we uh, customize the emitter a bit we made the circle bigger we uh, are bringing in just a few of those colors those are the colors that we've been using i added the green as well with a border on it so we can see the border two what's two that two's the thickness of the border the force it, it's going to fall we've got gravity we've set gravity to zero though if we have zero gravity and zero force it doesn't it really emit very well uh, i can't remember the default force i think is two or something so it just kind of like pluh. So this is uh, using the zim v value of a, a range, so a min between seven and a max. A zim will know how to handle that. It's really, really cool being able to pass in dynamic parameters like that. It's basically saying not all particles will get the same force. We want a range, but we could have said, I want particles to have three or five, three or six. Now all particles will either be three in force or six in force. Or we could have done a series. I want them to start off series, caps lock, a series of um, one, two, three. Well, actually, we do have a series that is like that. That goes from, I can't remember how to do that. But anyway, uh, maybe we start with 10, then we go to 40. That wasn't 10, and then we go to uh, 60. It's not 60 either. What happened to my zeros? My finger was in the wrong place. So start with 10, go to 40, then 60. Then it's gonna go 10, 40, 60. And you actually start to see differences. It's almost like it's spurting in different, like at different levels. It starts uh, looking like strange kind of fireworks where there's three levels of, um, you know, sequenced, uh, sequenced spurting. Neat, huh? But anyway, we said arrange. Those are all Zim V values. there's the range instead of always making a circle like that oh look that's the colors i didn't even think of telling you that that's like we'll randomly pick a color from those but we could have put in uh, a function that makes a snowflake and the function returns a snowflake that's made from a bunch of rectangles all rotated and a certain numbers of them or whatever we get these unique snowflakes and we can call the function here and whatever that function returns will then be emitted it's like amazing. That's Zim pick or Zim V that we introduced it in Zim 5, dynamic parameters, Zim V values. They're called, and we made that open source for people called um, pick. Uh, anyway, we're nearly done here. Let's go on through. We've got a pane. We make the pane ahead of time. And then when we actually are correct, we're playing the correct sound. We're making the steppers no longer have the mouse. We're centering the emitter on the stage and spurting it. And that spurt is what makes 60 of those. After a certain amount of time out, we show the pain. So that's showing the pain. Here's the pain. The pain also has a button. So this is a button that's centered on the pain. Custom button, customized in various ways. We've moved it down a little bit. We've applied a tap that says go. Zgo is Zim's short little way, like Zog. Zgo is a way to go to uh, a URL. And that's what that is. And then we're moving the label of the pane up a little bit, negative. So that, that's what makes us that pane, uh, which is, how many have we got there? Five? There. So there's the pane. There's the, the label of the pane has been moved up and the button has been moved down again. That's the custom button without a shadow. I found one, it had a shadow and this had a shadow. It just looked like shadows on shadows a bit much. We've um, chosen the colors based on various colors that we've been using throughout. And that's what we're doing 
in here. That's what this stuff is doing, is changing the background colors and roll colors. Uh, uh, that's the color of the font on the button. All right, so that's a custom button. Each of the things in here are doing something so that the app will look like what we want it to look like or be like what we want it to be like. So that uh, that's the end of it all. Uh, little frame dot made width. You can always use that for Zim. Frame dot made width is width is how to add that little thing in the corner there. Made width, and if you click on that, it'll go to Zim. We had to clear the frame, so there's a rollover on it, and uh, that's it. And this has been an explore. All of these, all of this stuff that's in here that we've just explored were to specifically make this app work in the way it works. It looks like a lot, but you, this is used over and over again. Here we are, we're scaling the X, we're choosing this amount of time, we're making it random, we're looping and rewinding it, and we're calling a function to change a color. Like all this stuff is needed, and it makes sense once you learn, you learn how to use Zim. Um, it looks like a lot, but I tell you, it's half the size, if not more, than anything you could do in HTML. Or, as we've been testing and showing over and over again, it's half the size of anything we've tested. It's like it's a third of the size of Flutter. It's um, it's half the size of HTML and CSS animations and stuff like like all this stuff is uh, really really compact and pretty straightforward for the most part. There are some tricky things in here that you know we, we've known how to do because we've been building interactive media for a long time. So no doubt, yes, tricky things, but uh, it's Zim. And thanks for exploring with us. Come on in to Zim, zimjs.com. We, we hope to see you there. All of that stuff, of course, is in the docs as well. So there's the docs. You do a quick search, find out what these parameters are and what they do. It's all there. Thank you very much. I'm this guy, Dr. Abstract, and this has been a Zim Explore. So uh, I hope you um, come and join us on Slack, zimjs.com slash Slack. Cheers. Uh, by the way, that's down here somewhere. One of these things, that's it right there. Uh, right. Come join us and find us on any of the social media, including Discord. So there's that as well. Cheers. Zim in space.